This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kirsten Ferreri, Los Angeles, California. The Golden Road by L. M. Montgomery. Chapter Three The Christmas Harp. Great was the excitement in the houses of King as Christmas drew nigh. The air was simply charged with secrets. Everybody was very penurious for weeks beforehand, and hordes were counted scrutinizingly every day. Mysterious pieces of handiwork were smuggled in and out of sight, and whispered consultations were held, about which nobody thought of being jealous, as might have happened at any other time. Felicity was in her element, for she and her mother were deep in preparations for the day. Cecily and the story girl were excluded from these doings with indifference on Aunt Janet's part, and what seemed ostentatious complacency on Felicity's. Cecily took this to heart, and complained to me about it. "'I'm one of this family just as much as Felicity is,' she said, with as much indignation as Cecily could feel. "'And I don't think she need shut me out of everything.' When I wanted to stone the raisins for the mincemeat, she said no, she would do it herself, because Christmas mincemeat was very particular, as if I couldn't stone raisins right. The airs Felicity puts on about her cooking just make me sick," concluded Cecily wrathfully. "'It's a pity she doesn't make a mistake in cooking once in a while herself,' I said. Then maybe she wouldn't think she knew so much more than other people." All parcels that came in the mail from distant friends were taken charge of by Aunts Janet and Olivia, not to be opened until the great day of the feast itself. How slowly the last week passed! But even watched pots will boil in the fullness of time, and finally Christmas Day came, grey and dour and frost-bitten without, but full of revelry and rose-red mirth within. Uncle Roger and Aunt Olivia and the Story Girl came over early for the day, and Peter came, too, with his shining morning face, to be hailed with joy, for we had been afraid that Peter would not be able to spend Christmas with us. His mother had wanted him home with her. "'Of course I ought to go,' Peter had told me mournfully. "'But we won't have turkey for dinner, because Ma can't afford it. And Ma always cries on holidays, because she says they make her think of Father. Of course she can't help it, but it ain't cheerful. Aunt Jane wouldn't have cried.' Aunt Jane used to say she never saw the man who was worth spoiling her eyes for. But I guess I'll have to spend Christmas at home." At the last moment, however, a cousin of Mrs. Craig's in Charlottetown invited her for Christmas, and Peter, being given his choice of going or staying, joyfully elected to stay. So we were all together, except Sarah Ray, who had been invited but whose mother wouldn't let her come. "'Sarah Ray's mother is a nuisance,' snapped the story girl. "'She just lives to make that poor child miserable, and she won't let her go to the party to-night either.' "'It is just breaking Sarah's heart that she can't,' said Cecily compassionately. "'I am almost afraid I won't enjoy myself for thinking of her, home there alone, most likely reading the Bible, while we're at the party.' "'She might be worse occupied than reading the Bible,' said Felicity rebukingly. "'But Mrs. Ray makes her read it as a punishment,' protested Cecily. "'Whenever Sarah cries to go anywhere, and of course she'll cry to-night, Mrs. Ray makes her read seven chapters in the Bible. I wouldn't think that would make her very fond of it. And I'll not be able to talk the party over with Sarah afterwards, and that's half the fun gone.' "'You can tell her all about it,' comforted Felix. "'Telling it isn't a bit like talking it over,' retorted Cecily. "'It's too one-sided.' We had an exciting time opening our presents. Some of us had more than others, but we all received enough to make us feel comfortably that we were not unduly neglected in the matter. The contents of the box which the story girl's father had sent her from Paris made our eyes stick out. It was full of beautiful things. Another red silk dress, not the bright flame-hued tint of her old one, but a rich, dark crimson, with the most distracting flounces and bows and ruffles, and with it were little red satin slippers with gold buckles and heels that made Aunt Janet hold up her hands in horror. Felicity remarked scornfully that she would have thought the story girl would get tired wearing red so much, and even Cecily commented apart to me that she thought when you got so many things all at once 
you didn't appreciate them as much as when you only got a few. "'I'd never get tired of red,' said the story girl. "'I just love it. It's so rich and glowing. When I'm dressed in red, I always feel so much cleverer than in any other color. Thoughts just crowd into my brain, one right after the other. Oh, you darling dress, you dear, sheeny, red-rosy, glistening, silky thing!' She flung it over her shoulder and danced around the kitchen. "'Don't be silly, Sarah,' said Aunt Janet, a little stymie. She was a good soul, that Aunt Janet, and had a kind, loving heart in her ample bosom, but I fancy there were times when she thought it rather hard that the daughter of a roving adventurer, as she considered him, like Blair Stanley, should disport herself in silk dresses, while her own daughters must go clad in gingham and muslin, for those were the days when a feminine creature got one silk dress in her lifetime, and seldom more than one. The story girl also got a present from the awkward man, a little shabby worn volume with a great many marks on the leaves. "'Why, it isn't new. It's an old book!' exclaimed Felicity. "'I didn't think the awkward man was mean, whatever else he was.' "'Oh, you don't understand, Felicity,' said the story girl, patiently. "'And I don't suppose I can make you understand, but I'll try. I'd ten times rather have this than a new book. It's one of his own, don't you see?' one that he has read a hundred times, and loved and made a friend of. A new book, just out of a shop, wouldn't be the same thing at all. It wouldn't mean anything. I consider it a great compliment that he has given me this book. I'm prouder of it than anything else I've got." "'Well, you're welcome to it,' said Felicity. "'I don't understand, and I don't want to. I wouldn't give anybody a Christmas present that wasn't new, and I wouldn't thank anybody who gave me one.' Peter was in the seventh heaven because Felicity had given him a present, and, moreover, one that she had made herself. It was a bookmark of perforated cardboard, with a gorgeous red and yellow worsted goblet worked on it, and below, in green letters, the solemn warning, Touch not the cup. As Peter was not addicted to habits of intemperance, not even to looking on dandelion wine when it was pale yellow, we did not exactly see why Felicity should have selected such a device. But Peter was perfectly satisfied, so nobody cast any blight on his happiness by carping criticism. Later on, Felicity told me she had worked the bookmark for him because his father used to drink before he ran away. I thought Peter ought to be warned in time, she said. Even Pat had a ribbon of blue, which he clawed off and lost half an hour after it was tied on him. Pat did not care for vain adornments of the body. We had a glorious Christmas dinner, fit for the halls of Lucullus, and ate far more than was good for us, none daring to make us afraid on that one day of the year, and in the evening, oh, rapture and delight, we went to Kitty Marr's party. It was a fine December evening. The sharp air of morning had mellowed until it was mild as autumn. There had been no snow, and the long fields, sloping down from the homestead, were brown and mellow. A weird, dreamy stillness had fallen on the purple earth, the dark fir woods, the valley rims, the sere meadows. Nature seemed to have folded satisfied hands to rest, knowing that her long, wintry slumber was coming upon her. At first, when the invitations to the party had come, Aunt Janet had said we could not go. But Uncle Alec interceded in our favor, perhaps influenced thereto by Cecily's wistful eyes. If Uncle Alec had a favorite among his children, it was Cecily, and he had grown even more indulgent towards her of late. Now and then I saw him looking at her intently, and following his eyes and thought, I had somehow seen that Cecily was paler and thinner than she had been in the summer, and that her soft eyes seemed larger, and that over her little face in moments of repose there was a certain languor and weariness that made it very sweet and pathetic and I heard him tell Aunt Janet that he did not like to see the child getting so much the look of her Aunt Felicity. "'Cecily is perfectly well,' said Aunt Janet sharply. "'She's only growing very fast. Don't be foolish, Alec.' But after that Cecily had cups of cream where the rest of us got only milk, and Aunt Janet was very particular to see that she had her rubbers on whenever she went out. On this merry Christmas evening, however, no fears or dim foreshadowings of any coming event clouded our hearts or faces. Cecily looked brighter and prettier than I had ever seen her, with her softly shining eyes and the nut-brown gloss of her hair. 
Felicity was too beautiful for words, and even the story girl, between excitement and the crimson silk array, blossomed out with a charm and allurement more potent than any regular loveliness, and this in spite of the fact that Aunt Olivia had tabooed the red satin slippers and mercilessly decreed that stout shoes should be worn. "'I know just how you feel about it, you daughter of Eve,' she said, with gay sympathy. "'But December roads are damp, and if you are going to walk to Mars you are not going to do it in those frivolous Parisian concoctions, even with overboots on. So be brave, dear heart, and show that you have a soul above little red satin shoes.' "'Anyhow,' said Uncle Roger, "'that red silk dress will break the hearts of all the feminine small fry at the party. You'd break their spirits, too, if you wore the slippers. Don't do it, Sarah. Leave them one wee loophole of enjoyment.' "'What does Uncle Roger mean?' whispered Felicity. "'He means you girls are all dying of jealousy because of the story girl's dress,' said Dan. "'I am not of a jealous disposition,' said Felicity loftily, "'and she's entirely welcome to the dress, with a complexion like that.' "'But we enjoyed that party hugely, every one of us, "'and we enjoyed the walk home afterwards, "'through dim and shadowed fields where silvery starbeams lay, while Orion trod his stately march above us, and a red moon climbed up the black horizon's rim. A brook went with us part of the way, singing to us through the dark, a gay, irresponsible vagabond of valley and wilderness. Felicity and Peter walked not with us. Peter's cup must surely have brimmed over that Christmas night. When we left the Mar House he had boldly said to Felicity, "'May I see you home?' And Felicity— much to our amazement, had taken his arm and marched off with him. The primness of her was indescribable, and was not at all ruffled by Dan's hoot of derision. As for me, I was consumed by a secret and burning desire to ask the story girl if I might see her home. But I could not screw my courage to the sticking place. How I envied Peter his easy, insouciant manner! I could not emulate him. So Dan and Felix and Cecily and the story girl and I all walked hand in hand, huddling a little closer together as we went through James Fruin's woods, for there are strange harps in a fir grove, and who shall say what fingers sweep them? Mighty and sonorous was the music above our heads as the winds of the night stirred the great boughs tossing athwart the starlit sky. Perhaps it was that Aeolian harmony which recalled to the story girl a legend of elder days. "'I read such a pretty story in one of Aunt Olivia's books last night,' she said. "'It was called The Christmas Harp. Would you like to hear it? It seems to me it would just suit this part of the road. "'There isn't anything about—about about ghosts in it, is there?' said Cecily timidly. "'Oh, no! I wouldn't tell a ghost story here for anything. I'd frighten myself too much. This story is about one of the shepherds who saw the angels on the first Christmas night.' He was just a youth, and he loved music with all his heart, and he longed to be able to express the melody that was in his soul. But he could not. He had a harp, and he often tried to play on it, but his clumsy fingers only made such discord that his companions laughed at him, and mocked him, and called him a madman because he would not give it up, but would rather sit apart by himself, with his arms around his harp, looking up into the sky while they gathered around their fire and told tales to while away the long night vigils as they watched their sheep on the hills. But to him the thoughts that came out of the great silence were far sweeter than their mirth, and he never gave up the hope which sometimes left his lips as a prayer, that some day he might be able to express those thoughts in music to the tired, weary, forgetful world. On the first Christmas night he was out with his fellow shepherds on the hills, it was chill and dark, and all except him were glad to gather around the fire. He sat, as usual, by himself, with his harp on his knee and a great longing in his heart. And there came a marvellous light in the sky and over the hills, as if the darkness of the night had suddenly blossomed into a wonderful meadow of flowery flame, and all the shepherds saw the angels and heard them sing. And as they sang, the harp that the young shepherd held began to play softly by itself, and as he listened to it he realized that it was playing the same music that the angels sang, and that all his secret longings and aspirations and strivings were expressed in it. From that night, whenever he took the harp in his hands, it played the same music, and he wandered over all the world carrying it, 
Wherever the sound of its music was heard, hate and discord fled away, and peace and goodwill reigned. No one who heard it could think an evil thought. No one could feel hopeless or despairing or bitter or angry. When a man had once heard that music, it entered into his soul and heart and life, and became a part of him forever. Years went by. The shepherd grew old and bent and feeble, but still he roamed over land and sea, that his harp might carry the message of the Christmas night and the angel song to all mankind. At last his strength failed him, and he fell by the wayside in the darkness. But his harp played as his spirit passed, and it seemed to him that a shining one stood before him with wonderful starry eyes and said to him, Lo, the music thy harp has played for so many years has been but the echo of the love and sympathy and purity and beauty in thine own soul. And if at any time in the wanderings thou hast opened the door of that soul to evil or envy or selfishness, thy harp would have ceased to play. Now thy life is ended, but what thou hast given to mankind has no end, and as long as the world lasts, so long will the heavenly music of the Christmas harp ring in the ears of men. When the sun rose, the old shepherd lay dead by the woodside, with a smile on his face, and in his hands was a harp, with all its strings broken. We left the fir woods as the tale was ended, and on the opposite hill was home. A dim light in the kitchen window betokened that Aunt Janet had no idea of going to bed until all her young fry were safely housed for the night. "'Ma's waiting up for us,' said Dan. "'I'd laugh if she happened to go to the door just as Felicity and Peter were strutting up. I guess she'll be cross. It's nearly twelve. "'Christmas will soon be over,' said Cecily, with a sigh. "'Hasn't it been a nice one? It's the first we've spent all together. Do you suppose we'll ever spend another together?' "'Lots of them said Dan, cheerily. "'Why not?' "'Oh, I don't know,' answered Cecily, her footsteps lagging somewhat. "'Only things just seem a little too pleasant to last.' "'If Willie Fraser had had as much spunk as Peter, "'Miss Cecily King mightn't be so low-spirited,' quoth Dan significantly. "'Cecily tossed her head, and disdained reply. "'There are really some remarks a self-respecting young lady must ignore.' End of chapter 3